All right, everybody, this is Ross. I wanna welcome you here to my channel. If you guys are new, we do all kinds of videos on things that are related to growing fruits and vegetables in really a backyard setting. Um, in this video, I would like to talk to you guys about some tips that I have to offer. I think that are really helpful for someone new or even someone that's more advanced in growing fruit and vegetables. I have some tips that I'd like to share with you guys. And these are um, some tips that are mainly inspired because I, I went to a friend's orchard really five miles down the road, right off the highway. Obviously a very similar climate, right? If we're five miles away, but there's definitely some differences in our microclimate. He seems to be a bit warmer, um, but I couldn't help but notice some of the other differences in terms of how, what his orchard looked like, what my orchard looks like, how it's performing. Um, obviously seeing some of the things that he has succeeded at, some of the things he's failing at, and to really reaffirm my beliefs into the successes that I'm having here. So the first tip I wanna really mention to you guys is actually in the soil. The soil is really important as everything we do as gardeners, as orchardists, we wanna make sure the soil's right first, right? Everyone knows that. We wanna have the right soil moisture, we want to have the right nutrients. We want to have the right pH. So what I like to do is either I like to amend my soil, uh, put down things like compost if we need to, maybe some, um, you know, in the fall, we put down some leaves that fall from these big shade trees that actually shade a lot of my yard, is we'll take those leaves, put them on the ground or in the beds, and those eventually throughout the wintertime turn into worm casting. So we can also add in things like micronutrients, silica or silicon is a really um, important trace element that I'm really a big fan of as I got to see this year with my summer garden, how successful that was. I think because that trace element really improved the natural pest resistance and natural disease resistance of those plants that I was continually applying that trace element to. So if we start off with the right soil, we're gonna have the healthiest plants possible. We're gonna then be on the right footstep. And one of the things I like to do for the soil here, guys, is I really am a big proponent of chop and drop. One of the things that permaculture really recommends is we like to build up the soil not necessarily by creating some compost piles. You can to speed up this process, but if you just lay your brown materials, your green materials down, here's some corn that I had cut out of our summer garden. We just laid this down. Underneath this is many layers of wood chips, as you can see. And over time, this has really turned my subpar soil over many years now into something that's quite respectable. At least I have a couple inches, excuse the, the camera there, of some really great topsoil. And underneath, I know for a fact, when I was a kid, this fence back here that you guys are looking at, um, in order to build this fence when I was a kid, my parents and I, we came out here one day and we spent the whole day building up a berm. And we got really the crappiest, cheapest soil we could find and we built this berm so that we could construct this fence away from the main road. And that always kind of stuck with me because I knew at least growing fruit back here along the berm or even back in this area, um, I wasn't gonna have much success. I was gonna really struggle because of the soil. So I needed to really, even without doing any soil sample whatsoever, I knew that I needed to really amend this. So I've been building the soil back here layer by layer year by year and something that has really worked out well is actually this comfrey and you can see this really green stuff here with these green dark leaves lots of flowers the bees love that stuff and i believe i don't have any proof i don't know if anyone does have any proof but i believe if you just put some comfrey and you plant that near something that's struggling a bit it's going to start doing better oddly um, definitely, without a doubt, it's great to chop and drop this. As we know, it, it really takes trace elements and minerals from below the soil deep down, has a very deep roots, and you can chop and drop that onto any plant, any tree, 
that you want and it'll break down rather quickly. So that's one of my bigger tips is actually in the soil. Now, my second tip involves kind of a philosophy of mine. Maybe others share this, a similar philosophy, but it's sort of based around neglect and that I don't necessarily want to be babying all these different plants. I want them to do their own thing. Because this is nature. Nature knows best, right? So if we can neglect them and maybe give them a little bit of push or a little bit of help in the soil, that's all we really need to do. I rarely water here. Um, I rarely spray here. Um, I rarely do anything in terms of um, some outside help other really than pruning. Um, so that's really key, I think, is that if you guys are really baby babying your plants, that's just the basic, I think, the basic level of growing any sort of plant is to know that you can't over baby them. You got to give them a little bit of neglect so that they can be strong, happy, and healthy. So that's my second tip. My third tip, and it's sort of another philosophy, maybe not of mine, but I really do think, compared to my friend's yard, I have a lot less disease pressure and a lot less pest pressure. And I think a lot of that has to do with the simple fact that we have just not fruit trees or just not fruiting plants on this property. I have many flowering non-edible plants that bring in a lot of pollinators and beneficial insects. And that's no crap. There, that's really, there's really some truth to that. You know, it's not like necessarily, um, I believe sort of in com companion planting or that certain plants do better next to other certain plants. I just think if you guys have some really key flowering plants on your yard, you're going to attract the right bugs that then eat the bad bugs, or you're just going to have more of the good bugs in relation, in ratio to the bad bugs. So you don't want to create an ecosystem for the wrong kind of bug. So what we can do is actually plant some of these flowering plants. Some of the ones I really like are bee balm. Fennel is insanely good. Um, you can get some flowering alliums that flower, I guess, earlier in the season. These are really good for bringing in um, not just honeybees or not just bumblebees, but things like parasitic wasps. And those really control the pest pressure in your yard. Now I've had my fair share of disease here on different things. We've had a little bit of peach leaf curl. I obviously struggle with my European grapes with black rot. We have some rust here on my apple trees that are dwarf. Um, we also have some rust on the figs. I've gotten some anthracnose in the past. We get obviously some mildew down here in the summer garden on the cucurbits. So it's not like we're not getting disease. We get some, um, some brown rot on some of the stone fruits. Overall, if we can really have our plants in the right amount of sunlight that these guys need, preferably full sun for most of these plants, we're gonna have that right airflow we're going to have that right sunlight that's going to dry these leaves off in a more humid place like mine. So we want to be focusing on the location, location, location of where we plant these things in our yard, in the right microclimate. Planting these apple trees in about six hours of light, I don't recommend it. I did this and it's just how it is for the, you know, for the future until I start a new orchard. So, you know, this is just is what it is. And, having that right location is going to make the biggest difference. Maybe instead of having them espiate here, these grapevines against the fence, I would rather have a cordon system, let's say out in the open. And that way they have better airflow and better disease resistance. So the things that are more prone to disease, like your stone fruits, your apples, your pears, your grapes, you want to put those in full sun. You want to put those in a lot of airflow. You want to keep them um, away from your more disease prone areas of your yard. Now, some of the things here don't necessarily get a whole lot of disease or even get a whole lot of pest pressure. Things like um, persimmon, the American persimmon, the Asian persimmon. Um, also the pawpaw. We have the mulberry, we have the gumi. Gumi is one of my favorites. Even here, the gooseberry does really well. 
the Hascap berry, the blueberry. My peaches are relatively good, as you can tell. Um, so there's a lot of things, even the fig here, guys, that we can plant, even though it may not be, maybe you would think the best climate for these kind of things, they might be some of the best things that you can grow. So that's another really great tip. And I have another tip that I've kind of forgot about in terms of your fruit, is if you guys are having really bad pest pressure here in your yard, it's a really good idea to pick up all the fallen fruit. You don't want to make this mistake. You don't want to get lazy or you don't want to plant too much than you can handle. Because if you plant more than you can handle and you can't keep up with this, as I had a, a brief moment here in my yard and I'm paying for it right now with the figs and I have figs that are splitting right now. I have figs that are then, because they're splitting, they're attracting ants and wasps and, and um, the spotted wing drosophilia, which is a fruit fly. So if you have figs that are fermenting or figs that are falling on the ground, it's only gonna encourage pests and critters to come at those fruits. And then you're gonna be battling those particular things. So it's really important that if you guys are gonna be doing this and you're serious about it, don't plant too much more than you can handle. Um, and if you do, pick up whatever you do, Pick up every single fallen fruit. Don't let anything ferment, um, even the leaves. Sometimes a fallen leaf that has disease on it can only then further proliferate the disease. So we wanna keep our orchards and our yards clean and tidy. That's a really, really big point. And I think that's one of the bigger differences between a friend of mine's yard and mine is that he has planted too much and he just can't keep up with it. The last little tip here that I'll leave you guys with is actually in the rootstock. And you can see with these fruit trees, they're all in a different rootstock for the most part. These are my Aspaya peaches. They do exceptionally well. Those are my apple trees that are dwarf. They don't do that well. It takes them a number of years for them to get themselves together. Here's some cherries that are semi-dwarf. Again, really not doing all that hot. And I would just recommend, I know that it's a good thing for beginner growers to grow these dwarf fruit trees or semi-dwarf fruit trees. You're gonna be way better off, guys, I think, if you just go for the standard type tree, you prune it to the right size, you get really good at pruning, you guys will have a lot more success. You'll also have a lot less disease pressure. So um, I thank you guys here for watching this episode for joining me here on the channel. Hit that subscribe button, guys. Um, check out our blog, figboss.com, and see our other videos that we've been doing on all the different fruits and vegetables we grow. We've done a video at this point on almost everything. So thank you guys here so much for watching. I know it's a little dark, but best I could do right now. I'll see you guys soon. Take care.